This is what leadership looks like. Hi, my name's Dev. Hi, my name's Ryan. And we're at COP26. At Kevin Grove Park for the Youth Climate Strike March. We're getting food on the agenda. Let's get marching. Yes! Woo! So what do you think, cop in your home city, right uh, at home? I love it. Like, I've always said that people make Glasgow and the more people that are here, the better. I mean, young people are really leading the movement on climate change. They're leading the conversation and they're making their voices heard. This is where the real conversations happen, outside, not inside. Our national leaders really need to get a grip of the situation that we're in and know that we need transformational change because, you know, as people, as banners are saying, there is no plan B. What impact do you think food has on our climate change and what can we do about it? Well, agriculture itself has one of the biggest impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. So I think we definitely have to have um, a change in agriculture production and that is just one very small aspect of the entire food system and I think for real change to be made we have to be including local people and indigenous knowledge and on the ground action and things are already happening on the ground. If you look around we're already having such an impact now we basically shut Glasgow down which is incredible. <laughs> This is no longer a climate conference. This is now a Global North Greenwash Festival. A two week long celebration of business as usual and blah, blah, blah. You as youth leader need to know that you are in a, representing millions of youth. Could you imagine how many youths are not here? So you have a great opportunity. My name is Bernice Cunningham. I come from Granada, Nicaragua. I study environmental law and uh, I study environmental sustainable management at the University of California. I work with grassroots organization in the Latin America region. I'm also part of different campaigns of such as Act for Food, Act for Change. What we're seeing in, the, in this COP is that youths are not being included in the discussions. They don't let them into the rooms. They don't hear them. We have this food, you are not listening to us, and it's true. I work in building wells and drinking water in Nicaragua, and too in the food systems, and strengthen the capacity of youth agriculture people to grow crops in an efficient way, in an organic way in Nicaragua. Basically, the objective of this meeting is to write a statement for policy decision makers to tell them what we think about not letting youths on the discussion, not letting youth voices. We talk too much and we need to stop talking and stop acting. And in the food system, definitely act for food, act for change is something beyond a slogan is something that we have to do. The organization of the United Kingdom and the rest of the world denounce that COP26 is not inclusive and is not transparency. The observers that in theory are the guarantee of transparency of the process are not included in the negotiation process. The letter basically was a statement that this COP is not inclusive, is not including the youth voices, the indigenous voices and civil society. And that's why we got this meeting with Baroness Boycott and uh, to present her the letter and to help us amplify the youth voices and the UK press. So during this week, there's been quite a lot of news stories about uh, youth and indigenous people feeling very um, kept, you know, away from COP and very much being on the streets rather than being in. How does this letter take the cause forward. So for me it's very important because the UK is leading this, it's the UK presidency, it's the UK legacy of the world. So I think it's very important that the UK sent a message to the rest of the world. It's very distressing that we have this conference that you know we have all pinned a lot on and that you who are the people it's all about feel excluded. It makes me ashamed. It's 
not good enough that we have this many people from the meat industry and this many people from the oil and the fossil fuel industries dominating the conversation at the COP. It's just not good enough. What is Act for Food, Act for Change? So it's a youth-led campaign. It's new, we just launched in May, um, and we're trying to become a global movement of youth from all over the world. Um, and we want people to focus on their personal actions, but we also want to hold government and businesses accountable for the actions that they take as well. Um, so this movement urges business and governments, UN agencies, youth, but also all global citizens to act boldly and promptly to help change our food systems. So, Act for Food, Act for Change envisions a world where the sustainable development goals are reached. Um, we envision a sustainable global food system that provides people with access to food and good health, but also is good for the planet. We would love to collaborate with other companies if they're sincerely aligned with our mission. And um, a lot of people say they are, and if you look at their actions, that's obviously not what they're, they're after. My name is Stephanie Sargent and I'm a youth leader at Act for Food, Act for Change. Some incredible people here today and I'm looking forward to asking you some very interesting questions. I grew up in Kenya and my old school was right next to a slum. So I grew up seeing the effects of poverty and food insecurity. So I've always wanted to help. What are some of the largest barriers to the mass adoption of regenerative agriculture and how can we overcome these challenges? One of the biggest barriers, I think, and the most harmful barriers to the adoption of regenerative agriculture is the myth that it won't have high yields. It will. I got involved in Act for Food, Act for Change through my masters. They thought maybe we could have someone from my organization working in Act for Food, Act for Change to really understand like what they're doing and how it's making an impact in the world. Now here I am at COP26 speaking at events and you know working with these amazing people to transform food systems. Fundamentally, we have a broken food system, right? I mean, th th this is why we're here today and it, it is, it's, it's causing huge, huge implications on our planet. There's a lot of talk about how food isn't being spoken about at COP. Um, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it's, it's a complete missed opportunity. You know, our food system is fundamentally broken. You know, 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from agriculture and, um, and our, our food system itself. 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come from food waste alone. The fact that um, our food and food waste isn't on the agenda is simply criminal. Part of what we do is, you know, the climate education, we make sure that we break it down to the, 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 the understanding, the, the language they understand, and we make sure that uh, the, the, weather, uh, the weather information system is actually very, very adequate. I got involved uh, with Act for Food, Act for Change because of my activities around the UN Food System uh, Dialogue, and uh, since then it's been very, very uh, amazing, you know, working with other young people uh, uh, across the world. That's what we're here at COP for to talk about, again, you know, how does food link in with the climate crisis and what we can do as ordinary citizens and as, you know, young people who are passionate um, to do something about it. In the Global South, they're already feeling the effects of climate change. It's not a future disaster. We as a generation up in our 20s right now, are you know tackling this crisis and I hope will be the last generation to tackle it. A lot of politicians say they say young people are the future. No, 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 no. Young people are not the future. Young people are creating change right now. We're at COP because we know food is a big issue on the climate agenda and it needs to be addressed, but we still don't have a lot of answers and we need to know kind of what's driving the, the reason why it's not at COP. Um, so I'm really excited. We're going to talk to Professor Tim Benton. And I, I really want to have, I have a lot of questions. Do you have any questions for him? I have so many questions. I'm so confused why food isn't in the debate. I think we need a dose of academia to really understand. We're here with Act for Food, Act for Change. And we, we know that food is really important, but we haven't been seeing that on the COP agendas. So we wanted to know, why do you think this is? I think there's, there are two main uh, issues here. One is ideology, and that is uh, 
it's the job of the market, it's the job of agriculture, it's the job of, of industry to produce something that can be sold in the market. So if there is demand for something, it's the job to produce it. And so agriculture appears, but not food, because agriculture is the kind of external, the factory that uh, farmers use to produce goods that go into the market. So it's not about uh, food per se, it's about that issue to do with, it's a outdoor factory um, and it's, fulfilling some market demand and and the ideology is that uh, our job uh, is to drive economies hard to make as much profit as possible uh, and if there's demand it's our job to fulfill it uh, on a global basis so that's the first thing it's ideological around the role of the market and the second thing is of course that COP is focused very much on um, the production of emissions and it's very easy to say, well, agriculture is kind of your outdoor factory. And what we want to do is reduce the emissions from agriculture and not worry about what food's been produced, or how the demand for food is being produced by the market in itself. And so it is all about, I mean, Boris Johnson said the other day, it's about his dream is to have guilt-free chocolate so that the technology underpinning the production that allows him to carry on eating whatever he wants to eat. So those two things together mean that it's really difficult from a political perspective to get that linkage between the production side, agriculture, and the demand side. And of course, the final uh, part of the, the whole thing is that for many uh, advanced economies, particularly which live and die by the ideology of the free market, it is absolutely not in people's minds, government's minds, to tell individuals what they should eat. And if you want to eat beef or ultra processed foods and make yourself ill, that's your decision and therefore markets should supply. So those three things make it really difficult. There's no sort of like set curriculum where young people can learn about climate change and its impacts. Um, and so I go around different schools, I do a lot of workshop programs. Like how many meals with meats in them do you guys eat each week? It's a good question. If I'm in the UK, I eat less meat um, because of where it comes from. It's been really inspiring just having you guys here in the room and being able to voice, you know, your concerns, I think that's amazing. My top actions for change is affordability. Everyone should be able to afford healthy and nutritious diets. My top actions for the Act for Food Act for Change campaign, human rights, food poverty and deforestation. Every child should also be able to access healthy and nutritious food, especially schools, so free school meals. I want to see uh, a youth young people at, at the table, at the same table with, uh, with the leaders, which is actually very important. And last but not least is that young people should get a seat at the decision making table. My top three actions are junk food advertising, healthy food for all and free school meals. Ask for food, ask for